Ladies and gentlemen, I have the, the legendary Mr. Bakari Sellers here. Um, we had intended to invite Bakari to come out uh, to Wilmington and to uh, feature his new book, um, My Vanishing Country. Um, we were just so excited and hyped you know, for you to come to Wilmington, but it didn't work out. And so consequently, we're going to conduct this book talk um, virtually. Um, and so any of you, if you put your name in the, in the comment section, we will send you a free copy um, of the book. Um, Bakari will be available at, at the end of the talk to uh, answer some of your questions, um, if, you, if you have any, not all of them, but, but some of them. So um, I encourage you to, to read the book. It's, 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 it's poignant, it's provocative, it's compelling. You'll, you'll laugh. If you're like Bakari, you'll, you'll cry. <laughs> but Carl, you're 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 a crier. So tell me, you know, when you wrote when you wrote this book, you know, I can't think of anything more self-actualizing than putting your life onto paper. Yes. And so when you when you put your life on paper, you know, you you say that you're a crier. Were there any moments where you you wept? Uh, actually, writing. The book, there were certain chapters which were difficult. Um, it's always tough for me to talk about the Orangeburg Massacre and my father and being shot and um, just living with him and knowing the pain of that struggle. So that, that's always very difficult. Um, and uh, recounting the birth of my um, children and my twins and my wife almost dying is also very difficult. Mm. Um, but I didn't feel it until the audible version. Um, when I had to actually read these words and there was so much emotion in my voice sometimes that we had to take breaks and stop and, and drink some, drink some hot tea <laughs> and, and pop, a, pop a throat lozenge. It was, uh, you know, I, this book, and I, I don't, I don't know how other people will take it. That's one of the parts of being an author now that, that, uh, builds your anxiety. You're unsure. Um, but I hope people go on this emotional role that I went on in writing the book. Um, because I did put a lot of, of emotion in it and my, my, my heart in it, and my truth in it. Um, and I'm very, very proud of what we were able to accomplish. So what did you learn about yourself while writing this that you didn't know? That I didn't know. Um, you know, when you go through things and you persevere and you come out on the other side, many times you just look forward to facing the next challenge. But for me, when I put my life on paper and when I... Uh, talk about the most important part of my life, which is the Orange Road Massacre. And then you talk about and build out some of the characters like Pop in my book, who is like mm -hmm. my brother, <laughs> here, who's my best friend, um, who actually married uh, Janisha Tate Lodho, who's actually from Wilmington, Delaware. What's, awesome. the, what's the really nice, the DuPont Hotel is where they got married. Yes, that's, that, that's the most historic, that's the nicest hotel oh. in the city. So yeah, I, I've I've been there. I've I've parted. All right, all right. I've hung out there. But but uh, in putting their stories down on paper and just kind of taking that roller coaster and talking about my anxiety, um, talking about the Charleston massacre, um, mm -hmm. talking about uh, um, my wife's birth. I, when you look at it, um, I, one of the things that I may, I don't I think I'm realizing now after rereading it and writing it. Yeah. Um, is that my mother is so, so really, really strong. I think I've, mm -hmm. I've unfortunately kind of taken that for granted. Um, mm -hmm. I have a better job of, of, of um, you know, just giving her her flowers while she's living as well. Mm -hmm. um, and um, in order to persevere everything that I've been through, um, I had to have some amazingly strong people around me. And so it's given me um, moments of, just pure gratefulness. So I'm anxious right now, but I'm extremely grateful for the road that I've traveled. Right. And so let's segue into, let's talk about, you know, you deemed February 8th, 1968 to be the most important day of your life. Can you share with us, for those of us who might not be familiar with the, with the Orangeburg massacre, and then just talk about that and some of the, the bloodstains specific to South Carolina. Yeah, I, you know, the Orangeburg massacre, uh, one of the tragedy beyond, beyond the deaths of Henry Smith, Samuel Hammond, and Delano Middleton, beyond the 28 that were wounded, beyond the fact that my father was one of those wounded and um, got his bond denied, and then he uh, subsequently went to prison. They, um, he, he, they, were, they charged him to try rioting. He became the first and only one-man riot in the history of this country. Mm -hmm. um, 
beyond the fact that my sisters, all of our names are Swahili. My sister's middle name is Abadame. It means born while father is mm. away because my, my mother was uh, pregnant and forced to give birth to a uh, child mm. while um, her husband, my father, was in prison. Um, beyond that entire layer of injustice, um, and the one that probably smacks us in the face the most is the efforts by which the state and country have covered up what happened that night. Mm. And, and we know Kent State, but no one knows South Carolina State. And so mm. um, looking at my father and understanding that his eyes don't pop like they once did or his shoulders aren't as upright as they once were from carrying the burdens of a generation and seeing that pain and then understanding the trauma of not just being black in America, but being the child of the movement in America and living with those scars. I mean, just tangibly speaking, you know, to have a father who, um, uh, or a parent for that matter, who has a felony on their record in the South, you can imagine how difficult that is. My father had a felony um, mm -hmm. as a result of that night's violence until he was pardoned in 1990. And so um, I'm, I'm more, I think I'm more angry um, than about that day than even my father is. Wow. Um, and that anger pushes me, but I have learned that anger is not a sin. Mm -hmm. uh, and I try to utilize whatever I can to push forward. You know, you, you, you mentioned, you mentioned anger and throughout the book, you mentioned empathy. Would you talk about those things and how it correlates with being an activist like yourself? Well, I think that when I, when people, when, so when black folk read this book, I want, I think they're going to get a sense of pride okay, and a, and, and a, and a sense of perseverance mm -hmm. to them just to become more intentional and purposeful as we change the world. When white folk read this book, I think that they're going to gain some level of understanding. Okay. Um, because we, uh, as Bishop Jakes once told me, you can teach people English and biology and, you can teach people arithmetic, but you cannot teach them blackness. And what I th think what I will do is spur some conversations that are difficult but necessary. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, we have, have to have we have to have understanding, mm -hmm. and we have to have some level of empathy. Okay. We live in a country right now where many people of color don't get the benefit of their humanity, which I talked about. And it's not just this isn't a new phenomenon. I mean, this goes all the way back. You know, my father. There was a portion we're talking about Medgar Evers, we're talking about the 16th Street Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. We're talking about fast forward to Ahmaud Arbor and Greer Taylor, mm -hmm. people who, whose lives were taken because they were being something less than human. And so I, I hope that we can get a sense of empathy. I hope when people read this book, they'll have some sense of understanding of the struggle of person of color in this country. Mm -hmm. And then we can have conversations about healing. And maybe I'm too optimistic about the power of my words, but I'm not going to let you take it away from me right now. You, you, you know, throughout the book, you know, you mentioned, you, you know, one of the impetus of writing this book is to, is to give voice to forgotten people. And we find that, you know, everybody seems to, throughout the last several years, I mean, we had, you know, we had white industry workers in Michigan and Pennsylvania that they claim to be forgotten people. Um, You've got agricultural workers in California, brown people that claim to be forgotten people. But you talk about, you know, you, you, you articulate forgotten people as, as, as black people in the rural South. Can you, can you talk about that, um, yeah. that segment of forgotten people? Yeah, and, and what I wanted to do is when we had these conversations of, of rural America, mm -hmm. when we had this conversation of working class, that's code for white. You know, when people in politics and in the media say, let's go see what they're doing in flyover country, they mean white folk. Like, what, right. what, are they, what is the working class man doing? They're talking about white people. Rural America, let, they're talking about white. And so what I wanted to do was say, look, let's look holistically at this picture. Let's look at the working, let's look at working class and let's look at those voices that have, these voices have not been, they're not necessarily uh, voiceless, right? It, it, but their voices have gone unheard. And so I just try to give them a platform. These are the, who are these people is a good follow-up question. Mm -hmm. And people are the church ladies who sit at uh, the first two, three rows in the church and they wear the big hats. And when you mm -hmm. hug them, you like Chanel number eight all day long. <laughs> yes. 
Um, they use two sticks of butter to cook their sweet potato pies. And <laughs> you know, but their hugs, they sustain you. Um, when you run for office, when I ran for office, these are the same ladies who gave me $5, which was all they wow. had. But that meant that they were going to stand up in church every Sunday during the visitor's announcement and say, I know I'm not a visitor, but I want y'all to go out and vote for little CL. Um, <laughs> when you were having a rough day, their hugs, they, they sustained you. These are the people we're giving a voice to. It's these people in the community. My father, one of the most, what I believe when, I'm, when I reread the book, the line that sticks out to me the most is one of the lessons my father taught me about mm. heroes walking among us. Mm. And my father never wanted me to get caught up in the fact that, you know, the country may teach you that it's about Martin, Malcolm Rosa, and maybe John Lewis. Mm -hmm. But my father wanted me to know all of those heroes and sheroes, which are the shoulders I stand upon today. And I gave those people voice too. So that's, those are the forgotten men and women that we highlight and we talk about. You know, when you look at the, you know, when you look at the, 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 the white working class, I mean, they kind of went, they went, Road and they, you know, they abandoned. They abandoned the Democratic Party, you know, for President Trump. Do you, do you ever think that, that, and you mentioned some failed policies in your book that, some failed Democratic policies as well as Republican policies. Do you, do you ever this group might go go rogue and say I'm going to become a Republican? So that's a, that's actually a really really good question. Um, you're doing your best Don Lemon and Chris Cuomo impersonation today, aren't you? <laughs> You, you, you're doing some, some good questioning um, over here. You know, the unique thing about 2016, and one of the things I'm most proud of about this book is, mm -hmm. this book is not really a partisan book. I think you would agree. It, it, uh, we talk about it. Unequivocally, unequivocally, it, yes. It's politics in it, but it's, it's really not a partisan book. Mm -hmm. um, unique thing about 2016, and I don't have the, you gotta have another author here to talk to you about it, because I don't have the audacity to believe I know the answers. 53% of, of white women voted for Donald Trump. Uh, right. Left, left Hillary Clinton at the proverbial altar. Don't understand that. Don't claim that. Know why. Um, but I do believe that the R Republican Party um, and what it symbolizes today has moved further and further away from the inclusivity and the diversity that many people of color value. And it's going to be very hard to reclaim that. And so I don't see this group that I'm talking about in this book fleeing. Um, but I do see it demanding more from the Democratic Party and demanding more from the leadership such as Joe Biden. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. And so back to this, back to this whole narrative of forgotten people, I was really struck. What struck a chord to me was, you know, as you talk about your mother, you paid, you know, you paid homage to, to black women specifically, um, in your book. Yes. And you, and you, and you took and you, you drew upon Zora Neale Hurst and a mule, um, Mule reckoning. Yes. And, and, and I'm just quoting the book. You say, you know, um, talk about Jane Crawford and their eyes are watching God. And, and basically, you know, you say the mule is, is worked to death and has disposition rooting with mistreatment and yet was able to carry immeasurable loads like the black woman. Yes. Do, you think, do you think that mule rec reckoning, do you think that that is for 2020? Though she wrote this in, during the Harlem Renaissance. It's happening right now. Uh, you, you see, you see. Uh, I did a, a, a book event with Kamala Harris, who I love and adore. I, I, I just, you know, she is. She's a really, really good friend of mine. We we have conversations all the time, and she plainly stated. She said, "Black women are just tired of being thanked." You know, we always say thank you. We just say thank you to black women, and we have a level of expectation that they're going to be there for us because they never let us down. And every time they come through, we just say thank you, but we never. Uh, yeah, I'm friends with this dude named Sean Combs. People call him Puffy. <laughs> Puff, Puff always talks about the illusion of inclusion. Okay. Because, you know, people just want to have a, have, have a person of color or a woman at the table so they can say they had uh, that person of color or woman at the table, but then they don't want to hear from them. And that's how we treat black women in the Democratic Party. And it's time that we give them a voice. It's time that we give them leadership. And it's time that we allow them to lead it. Uh, I am, for one, pulling for that and, and hoping that that happens. And, and the reward will be you'll be, you'll be victorious. Um, we'll see what happens, though. If, if uh, you know, if you could resurrect one prominent black female historical or political figure to help us navigate these troubling times, who would it be? Ella Baker. And so, what's that? 
or, or Fannie Lou Hamer. It would be one of the two because both of them have the unique ability to navigate the political process. I said Ella Baker because she organized young people of color better than anybody in the history of mankind. She organized SNCC and gave them a voice and a purpose. And thinking about my father and Julian and Marion and James Foreman and all of these people, I'm like, that's a, you did a hell of a job organizing these, these people. But uh, Fannie Lou Hamer was just a bad woman now. And Fannie Lou, Fannie, imagine Fannie Lou Hamer versus Donald Trump right now. Imagine those being the messengers. I mean, like, seriously, like, let's, let's sit back with that for a minute. So it would be one of those two would be the, the woman that I would, I would choose for this moment. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. And so back to, back to activism and, and just back to your, back to your, back to your history. Um, you, you know, you do, you do, you are a Morehouse man. Can you, can you tell us what, what does it mean to be a Morehouse man and what are your thoughts on the future relevance and viability of HBCUs? So I can tell, where, where'd you go to school? <laughs> I'm not going to incriminate myself. <laughs> uh, you know, we have this saying that you can always tell a Morehouse man. Uh, you just can't tell him much. <laughs> and so um, I appreciate it. I, I, you know, this is a love letter to a lot. A lot of things. A letter to black women, a love letter to the South, a love letter to my mother and father in different parts, a love letter to Pop, um, a love letter to Morehouse. Yes. yes. Um, and, and Morehouse gave me so much. I mean, it taught me the value of leadership. I always say that Morehouse had put a crown above my head and, it, and it, mm -hmm. it motivated me to grow into it. You think about the alums, the Samuel L. Jacksons, the Spike mm -hmm. Lees, the Julian Bonds, the mm -hmm. David Thatchers, the Edwin Moseses, the the John David Washington and the Martin Luther King Juniors. And you go and just get this experience that it, it cultivates you to want to go out into the world. You know, and people ask me, what quote do I live by? And I, with all due respect to any educator wa watching this, or if your mama's an educator, you know, either you or her can be number two. But the greatest educator of all times is Benjamin Elijah Mays mm. from Greenwood, South Carolina. Mm. Uh, without Benjamin Mays, there'd be no... Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Benjamin Mays once said, "In all things that you do, you do them so well that no man living, dead, or yet to be born can do them better." Mm -hmm. That's the spirit in which I try to uh, take on any project. Um, I tell my kids, uh, well, especially my my fourteen year, my sixteen month olds, they don't listen to me that well. <laughs> my, my fourteen year old, I'm like, look, if you want to be, if you want to be a, a, a garbage man, a garbage man, then you go out and you be the best possible garbage man you can be. You know. Mm -hmm. You want to own waste management. Um, if you want to be a street sweeper, be the best possible street sweeper you can be. Whatever you're doing, excel. Make sure that you're changing the world around you and improving the plight and load of others. Morehouse taught me those things. It also taught me to appreciate my blackness. One of the things that I hate mm. is when people say they're colorblind. Okay. Um, and the reason being is because I don't want you to be colorblind. I want you to see me for the richness and the value of my diversity and what I bring to the table. When you say you're colorblind, you, dis, you, you, you devalue everything in my experiences that I'm bringing. In Morehouse and HBCUs, they help you understand that richness. And I also, I talk about it in the book. I went to an all-male historical black college, and it was one of the most diverse places on earth. Wow. The diversity there was so robust. I mean, from people from around the world, different backgrounds, different, different geographies, different upbringings. Uh, but they were all, you know, um, you know pushing and striving to, to be leaders. HBCUs have an amazing place and role in our communities and whether or not you're going to, you know, um, Delaware State or South Carolina State, um, we have to do everything we can to lift up these places of uh, higher learning. And so, you know, with a, with a declining, you know, black population and a future workforce that only 25 jobs, you know, will require college degrees, what are your thoughts on the future viability and relevance of HBCUs? Well, they have to evolve, you know, like, like um, most things. Evolve and adapt. Probably adapt is, is a, probably a, a better word. I, I'm, I'm terrified of a lot of HBCUs, like the Morehouse, the Morehouses, the Spellmans, the Hamptons, the Howards are going to be okay. I mean, they're suffering, but they're going to make it through this COVID-19. I'm worried about other institutions because a lot of these campuses, they won't, they, they you know, are having to get room and board refunds now. Mm -hmm. They won't. Um, they won't make it through the fall semester with the kids on campus. I don't know the financial impact. They don't have these huge endowments. And so I'm, I'm concerned about their 
their uh, livelihood and longevity. Um, yeah. I think they're coming upon us to take care of these institutions mm -hmm. and do the very best we can. So if, if, uh, if Stokely, if he chooses Howard over Morehouse, will you disown him? No, 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 no. Uh, I would definitely say he's his mother's child, but <laughs> we, will, we, will, we will keep the boy. He, he's a smart boy. Mm -hmm. Okay. This next question, I just want to preface it by just reading a quote of yours um, in the book, and it's, it's, it, it's, it's around the time when you became the first um, the youngest African-American elected official, you know, in the country. Um, and this is what you said. You said, as I walk up the 52 steps of the state house during those early days and months, my 22 year old self often would be thinking and psyching myself up. I'm about to shake some shit up at this Capitol. This millennial is, is to go in there and wobble the foundation of racism and bigotry and classism and inequality. And if I didn't, you know, if I did not, you know, know that this was, was, was your book and just that was an isolated quote, I probably would say, you know what, that's AOC, you know, talking. And so from, <laughs> so from looking at, you know, from looking at, you know, from looking at your experience and just looking at this quote, I find that, you know, that, or at least I think that AOC and this, 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 this wave of, of more progressive Democrats, I mean, you, you kind of wrote the playbook. You know, you wrote the playbook for them, and you kind of have, they have the same values and same drive that you have, yet, you know, you, um, you tend to side more often with the moderate, yeah. the moderate, moderate wing, the Hillary Clintons, the Clyburns, the Maxine Waters. And so, with that said, could you talk about um, generational div diversity within the Democratic Party and how to build That's bridges? That's a great idea. Uh, the, 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 your question went extremely well. Um, and yes, I think a lot of it has to do with my experience legislating. And I'd say that because when I got elected in 2006, it was before this new age of kind of elected officials came through, right? Um, we used to, I, you, know, you know who I looked up to? When I started running for office, I started, I announced um, September 18th of 2005. Uh -huh. But when I announced for office, Barack Obama was really a, a great orator. Like he had, but he had just given a speech in 2004. I mean, he wasn't, he hadn't reached the mountaintop. Who we looked up to was Deval Patrick. Wow. Because Deval Patrick was already a governor huh? at the time. He, he had reached the heights that, oh. that, that pinnacle. You know, Deval Patrick was the one who we were trying to figure out how he top of being a black statewide elected official in a really good one. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, as I navigated those eight years, I learned so much about meeting people where they are. Mm -hmm. I learned um, about having to work with Republicans, things that are taboo now. Wow. I learned that throwing rocks is not the best way to legislate. I served with Tim Scott. Wow. In fact, we used to make Tim Scott buy lunch. Tim Scott, Tim Scott got elected in 2010. He was a baby when I, I mean, I was already, I was already experienced. <laughs> enough. I had already been serving for four years when Tim got elected in the state house. Uh, I served with Jeff Duncan, who's now a United States Congressman. Mick Mulvaney was the president of my freshman class. Mick Mulvaney, former chief of staff to Donald beside me mm. um, in, in the state house. And so I had to work with these people. They were friends of mine, our friends of mine. We had to kind of talk through, uh, we had all of these all of these things and so i had i had a different perspective i believe in i believe in practicality okay. in my life. i don't i don't appreciate people promising me and and you know i say this with all due respect to to uh, uh bernie sanders but when you have a 40-year track record and you are promising large agenda items and yet you have never accomplished those things it for me looking through a lens of practicality is a problem but also coming from the South and understanding the struggle and understanding and looking at things through the lens of the movement, you're more inclined to, you're more inclined to support in that as well. And I think that there was a big void uh, was with Elizabeth Warren, my good friend, Pete Buttigieg, who um, I'm, I'm doing a book talk with as well um, and, and trying to get people to have that level of understanding. Mm -hmm. Now you, you got, you know, you got your kind of, well, you've, you got your, Political start. You were a uh, intern with uh, with Congressman Clyburn, uh -huh. and I just this just made me. I, I think I fell to the floor just 
laughing when I read this, but could you first would just, you, you know, I think the big, the big thing that your book does is that it, 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 it brings to the forefront this beef that South Carolina and Georgia has with peaches. Correct. Union. Georgia does not. I don't even know why they call the peach state, but I digress. And I don't like Georgia football, but that's not <laughs> there. And, and, and so I, I was just, you know, so the, so the, so the, the time when you were an intern for, for Representative Clyburn and you all, as an intern, you had to pass out peaches to all the congressional people and you gave somebody a bruised peach. A bunch of bruised peaches, yes. And, so, <laughs> and, why, and, and who did you do that and why? Well, <laughs> uh, Cap, Catherine Harris at the time, she was a former Secretary of State and she was responsible for reading these Chad ballots in Florida and we remembered her. And now she was a United States congressman. And um, I don't think she cares for peaches that much anymore. <laughs> and so that, that, was, uh, the, the, that was us being young and youthful, uh, prideful, and remembering uh, the injustices that people had done. Okay, so if you were a young, prideful intern today, who would you, who would you give a bruised peach to? Devin Nunes. Devin, Devin Nunes gets all the bruised peaches. <laughs> Ted Cruz too. Nobody likes Ted Cruz. Republicans wow. don't even like Ted Cruz. Wow. So he did a Bruce speech. Okay. So I'm giving <laughs> one in the Senate and one in the House to Devin Nunes and Ted Cruz. You know, and and so speaking of food, you know, your book kind of exposes your love affair with food. You know, you yes. you talk about the Waffle House chili dogs with slaw. And in, in a recent tweet, you know, you mentioned, you know, you, met, you, you asked, is it permissible to put chicken Super and grits? Yes. And, and, so, and so my question to you is that are you in favor of, this, of this, new, this new wave of gentrifying southern foods? This is a tough question here. Your line of questioning is getting me. <laughs> um, no. I'm not. I, I appreciate when <laughs> one of the things that makes me chuckle is the honesty by which I describe the Waffle House. <laughs> yeah. um, and <laughs> I just want I want people to read that to truly understand yes. what it means. <laughs> we we don't we in the South we want you that is our culture. We don't gentrify per se. We want you to come in and, and just get it and enjoy it. Yes. I can take you right now, down in King Street, South Carolina. It's a center block building. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to get some of the best barbecue you've ever had in your life. They wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning. They raise their own pigs. They start cooking them early. Mm -hmm. um, we're, not, we're not eating none of that really bad North Carolina barbecue, whatever that, whatever that is they have up there. And in Texas, it's just a slab of brisket. <laughs> I don't know what that is. But, but when you come to South Carolina, we make sure that we give you all the delicacies. A lot of it is from the delicacies of things like shrimp and grits. So, so what, what what would be what would be the what would be the most criminal at a at a southern fish fry, serving only unsweetened tea or serving the fish with wheat bread? You would probably get beat up for the unsweet tea, but you'll get arrested for wheat bread. Like we, why would you, <laughs> why would you do that? Look, you need white bread, you need mustard and hot sauce. That's it. And a and a paramedic if you're not from there. In a pair, yes, and you get one slice of bread per piece of fish. So you just put it in there, and then you just kind of fold the fish over, and you're good to go. And I, I mean, it helps because when you get a bone stuck in your throat, you know you take the white bread, and the bread pushes it down. So I mean, they're, they're just they're just ways. I mean, we more people need to come down south to understand the true delicacies of life. Okay. And so as we, you know, as we're talking about southern culture, you know, I remember when I lived in Charleston years ago. If you wanted to penetrate in any social circle, the first question that people would ask you is what, what church do you attend? And Correct. I know that today that, that, that isn't the case. Do you think, do you think the black church is, is impotent in 2020? Impotent is probably too bold of a word. I think it's not fulfilling its true mission. I think the wave, I think the wave of capitalism had, and culture of capitalism has replaced the mantra of activism mm -hmm. in the black church. What used to be a church that was filled with uh, activist ideologies, which was, which was uh, a safe for going in and getting your spirit uh, re renourished, your body and soul renourished, mm -hmm. so you can go back out and create change, has now been a place that, that 
uh, we we try to figure out which church can be the mega church or have different branches the fastest. And so I challenge the church to get younger in its leadership and become more progressive in this book. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. And another thing that I thought was interesting is that, you know, you mentioned when you going back to the Orangeburg massacre, you mentioned that some of the white people against you know, against the movement against blacks because they were misinformed. They thought that blacks had shot the first, had fired the first shots. And so the question about the, 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 the perniciousness and, and danger of, of being misinformed. And can you talk about that and the, and, and the work that you're doing as a CNN commentator and writer? So I'm, I'm new to this writing thing. And so I, please, please let me know how well I'm doing well <laughs> uh, or just keep my day job. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I do think that, Facts matter. I think that okay. truth is something. There aren't there aren't like two sides of the truth. I mean, it's truth and everything else. Especially as we go through this pandemic, I think that we have to into in our media. There's a difference between broadcasting and journalism. Mm-hmm. And for far too long, we've just been broadcasting things without checking them, mm-hmm. giving the president or whomever. Um, just uh, you know, this carte blanche to go out and misinform and lie mm-hmm. to the public, and um, I, I, we need to make sure that we re- we are focusing on. I'm not a journalist. I, I'm I'm a commentator. I give my opinion, but my journalist friends have to make sure that they are back according to the journalism that's healthy for our communities. Okay. And you know, it, it's amazing. Like on on the CNN team, there seems to be special synergy between you and April Ryan and and Angela Rye and and Andrew Dillon. And so would you talk about that relationship? And let's say if if there was jive talk or playing the dozens, who would win? Oh, me. No. (laughs) Angela, probably. Angela, probably. But I'm I'm probably the wittiest. Andrew is the most laid back. April is from Baltimore, so I'm not going to put that, I'm not going to put that past her. But, you know, grew up, that's all we did. We jived each other. We played the dozens, me and Jerry. Uh, there was nothing uh, that was off limits. Um, you know, your mom is so fat, she jumped in the sky and got stuck. You know, those type, <laughs> those type things that we just, we just, we just went in it. And, you know, that type of banter back and forth um, helps me with my, my nimbleness on my feet. And, um, and it dates all the way back to, um, you know, slavery and coming through those things. You can actually trace that type of banter back and forth. Um, but um, that that type of, of of dialogue has helped me with my nimbleness both in the courtroom and on TV. Wow! And so, like I say, you do a lot of work on CNN. So I have a hypothetical here for you. Sure. Okay. Vice President Biden has a mental slip up and mistakenly calls you up instead of Congressman Clyburn, and he says, "Bakari, your influence and in the people of South Carolina saved my nomination campaign." I know I'm going to win this election. Therefore, I want you to tell me who I should pick for vice president, secretary of state, attorney general, and one potential Supreme Court justice nominee. All right. That's easy. Vice President Kamala Harris. Easy choice. (laughs) Um, Secretary of state. This is going to surprise people, but I think people did to be a great secretary of state. Wow. Hmm. Um. Um, Attorney General, Klobuchar or Warren, Supreme Court Justice, Kentonji Brown Jackson. Okay. Now, now say this again. Kentonji Brown Jackson, uniquely enough, is the first cousin of Paul Ryan, or second cousin of Paul Ryan. She's a black woman. I know, it's the, it's, it's, you got to Google it. They're, they're, it's, a, it's a fascinating family tree. Okay, okay. So just move, moving right along, you know, in the, in the book you sh- your, uh, your experiences with anxiety and its, and its prevalence among other mental health challenges in the black community. What advice do you have for black people interested in creating healthy conversations about mental health and trauma with their families and loved ones? This is a tough one because we're actually in Mental Health Awareness Month. And um, my good friend, Charlamagne the God, who's a, a radio host of The Breakfast Club, we we talk about this often. I suffer from anxiety um, in the book. Trace it back to, um, you know, not only being a child of the movement and living with those scars, but also um, I trace it back to um, 
you know, you know I had a friend who, who passed away at a very mm -hmm. early age and kind of, I, I didn't grow up with the sense of invincibility that most young people do. Mm -hmm. um, and I, most black people, especially black men, think that the only person we should talk to about our mental health issues is our barber. Well, some of us, <laughs> I don't know about you. Well, well um, that doesn't apply. <laughs> That doesn't apply anymore. But for me, and it looks like it doesn't apply to me anymore. Um, it's our barber. And so I I wanted to let people know that my name is Bukari Sellers and I'm on CNN. I have a beautiful wife, a beautiful family. I have an amazing book that I put together. Yet and still I still suffer with issues of anxiety. And it's okay. And we're gonna talk about it. We're gonna utilize it as a superpower. The fears irrational or not. We're going to use that to motivate us and push us forward. And um, those discussions, have, you know, that's healthy. I cannot change the world unless I myself are healthy. You cannot be broken and go out here and change other people's lives. It just doesn't work that way. So what are, what are some of your self-care practices? Um, speaking to people when I need to. Speaking to people with, like, letters behind their names. <laughs> 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 Not just Tremaine Barber. Uh, that's first. Um, not ma making a conscious and purposeful effort not to hold things in that are bothering me. Um, my wife would always get on me because I'm the person who does not. Um, you remember, do you know the Donnell Jones song that was a remake of Stevie Wonder? I don't want to bore you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, you know, I always would be like, I don't want to tell people my issues. Everybody's going through their own. There's no reason to. And those things would just build up and build themselves in unhealthy ways. So, um, just being able to do that. I have outlets. I speak to Bishop Jakes and Tyler Perry on a regular basis just to kind of let that go and let loose. Um, and um, spending time with family, taking time for yourself, a little time of 30 minutes just to yourself. I, right now, I spend that time, you know, on a Peloton, three minutes every day just myself and music and, you know, a Peloton instructor, just kind of centering myself. Um, and so it, it feels good. I'm in a really good space. My family's healthy. I'm healthy. Um, and I get to spend time with amazing people like those of you all in, in Wilmington. So, hey, uh, you, you, you've written a one. What's the last great book that you read? So <laughs> I've actually read a lot. Um, Abdul Al Saeed, Healing Politics is a great book. He's, no, he's a new colleague of mine on CNN. He has a master's in public health, great book. It talks about empathy and how we can find some center. Um, oh, I actually have a book here that I, I've been sharing with everybody. My neighbor is Anthony Hamilton. I'm mm. lucky enough to live in there. Color green. He had, he had, it's called uh, Cornbread Fish, Cornbread Fish and Collard Green. And he goes, it's like a memoir throughout his life. Wow. But then he has like recipes, like olive greens with smoked turkey. Mm. Like he lays out, he lays out the recipes. No, really no, bra no, no braised, no braised collard greens. <laughs> Not no. Uh, and um, Don Winslow's new book. Um, I'm not a. I really am not a big fiction guy, mm. and my books just fell behind mm. me. Uh, but the border is what it's called. So uh, this is Don Winslow's. Uh, oh, excuse me, broken. The borders is a old book, healing politics. Wow. Uh, so these are the these are the two books that uh, this book. Mm -hmm. it, I, and for someone like myself who's really not into a lot of fiction, mm -hmm. um, this is six short stories, mm -hmm. and they are amazingly put together. I mean, this is an amazing book. And you also made made mention in my vanishing country that you may you may begin a work on on writing another book that discusses race and religion. Correct. If this book does well, and I'm grateful for your, I mean, I'm grateful for everything that you have done and your library has done for me to promote my efforts and give me a voice. You didn't have to, and so for opening your doors to your community, to an author like myself, you didn't have to do that. And I'm so grateful that you did. So first of all, I'll just I really want this book to be a bestseller. And when I go to New York Times, and people ask me why, the reason being is, you know, being turned down 30 times for a book is a lot. Um, but but if this book does well, then there'll be other people of color, other young people, other people who are not traditional can come in and tell their stories too. And so 
that's why I really want this book to do well. And yeah, my next book, I want to write one with my wife. Um, and then I want to write one, a, a political and, and faith book to talk about religion and talk about, uh, you know, be it, be a more political book than this, but I'm really pleased with my vanishing country and, um, it's my heart and my truth. And I'm just thankful for you and, and, and your library for giving me this chance. Yeah. And thank you. And, and like I say, and we, we thank you in the library field. You were responsible for getting a new library built in Denmark. Many That's years right. Many years back. So that's my, I tell people all the time, to this day, that's my number one legislative accomplishment. And people like elaborate. I'm like, yes, because we are after school programs. We use it for summer reading programs. People do their resumes there. I mean, it's a, a place out. They can read a good book and create my vanishing. It's a, it's awesome. So yeah. And so my last question to you, do you have any do you have any future political aspirations? I'll be running for Congress soon. Um, I don't know when that is, but soon I want to run. Uh, for the 6th Congressional State District, which is held by Jim Cliver. Uh, wonderful. Uh, wonderful. Well, wonderful. Well, Bakari Sellers, it, it has been an honor. Thank you so, so much. And again, if you have any questions for Bakari, um, just comment in the, in the comment thread. And if you put your name in the comment thread, uh, we will send you uh, a free copy of My Vanishing Country. So, Bakari, Sellers, again, it's been an honor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a blessed day. You too. Take care now. All right, thanks.